All right, if you'll open up your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11, please. Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And the guy killed it right there. Today I'll be talking about faith. All right, today I'll be talking about faith. Faith is one of the teachings we're going to be covering in soteriology. Soteriology means the study of salvation. Now remember, we're going through our lessons in theology. So there are many branches, ecclesiology, study of the church, soteriology, study of salvation, eschatology, study of end times, pneumatology, study of the Holy Spirit. So I'm giving you all those things. Those have been the first lessons that I've taught for two and a half years when I started my ministry. And the number one recommend, recommendation I always give is those studies, theological studies. So uh, I always enjoy returning back to them because a lot of times we need to go back to the basics. A lot of times we need to refresh ourselves on why we believe in these concepts and Sometimes, even ba very basic doctrines, we don't know where, what are the verses to prove them. So that's the reason why this is sometimes good for us. And there are things that we missed out on these supposed things we call basics. So let's cover faith, all right? First thing we're going to cover in the topic of faith is what is it? What is it? So the definition of faith, the definition of faith which is the standard Hebrews 11.1. 1. Very simple. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Meaning that faith is believing without seeing. It's that simple. Faith is believing without seeing. Now I want you to go to two passages, James 2. James chapter 2. And then Acts chapter 16, excuse me, Acts chapter 16. James chapter 2 and Acts chapter 16. Now that we understand the simplicity of what faith means, it's believing without seeing, a lot of people apply it wrongly. When you ask a person, are you saved by faith? Everybody will agree. And majority of people you talk to, they'll say, oh, I believe, I believe, or I have faith, I have faith, or I believe in Jesus, etc." But most of the time when they say those things, they don't know what they're talking about, or they have not really done those things. They just think that they've done those things. See, so over there, because they think they've done those things, that means it's more of a head belief. So a head belief must be distinguished from heart belief. That's a mistake that everybody makes. So I like how this picture illustrates about having a head belief, and then it goes into the heart, actually. So if a person really believes then what's going to happen is, of course, it always starts with the mind, right? You hear it, you know it, you think about it, but do they believe it enough where it finally hits their heart? And when it hits their heart, then they're like, I really got it, right? So that's the distinguishing of the heart versus head belief. Head belief is just something that passes in the mind, right? But you don't really get it. Once the head belief or the head starts believing it, it should reach to a point where you know truly to the point of, oh, I really got it. That's the kind of feeling, right? So if you have that kind of feeling right there or that instinct or that inclination that, oh, I really got it, then we see right here that's the heart belief. It's not just some passing cognitive function that's just in there and then it's just gone and you don't really fully understand what it means. You fully understand it that your whole heart is put into it. 
So this is demonstrated in James 2, verse 19. The Bible says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. But notice right here, that's not sufficient. The devils also believe and tremble. See, right there, we don't deny that, hey, if you believe Jesus is God who died, buried, resurrected, and people will say, yeah, I do, yeah, I do, well, fine, but guess what? Satan also believes in that. I mean, he saw it. He was there. So he's not just going to say, oh, that never happened. No, Satan, knew, uh, Satan knows it happened because he was there. So he believes in that, but it's on his head. It's not applicable to the heart where you put all your faith on Christ alone sufficiently for your salvation. See, the devil actually never did that, which is pretty obvious on why. The obvious reason why is that Satan, he trusts more in himself. Satan thinks that he can beat God. Satan wants to be worshipped as God. Satan hates God. There's no way that he's going to put his all whole heart, and then rely that, and then apply that to his Lord, Jesus Christ. If you look at Acts chapter 16, verse 31, Acts 16, 31, does Satan believe there is a God? Of course. Does Satan believe Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected? Of course. But when you ask the question, can, did Satan put his trust on Jesus Christ to save him from his sins and to save his soul, then see, then it's not really like, yes, it's like, uh, right? That shows that we know then there is a distinguishing or a difference with head belief and heart belief. So if we look at Acts 16, 31, the key is right there. The key is, and they said, believe what? Not in, but what? On the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. It's believing wholeheartedly that you act upon it. So, an example is given where it's one thing to know that bridge is going to hold you if you walk on it. But you don't really believe on it until you really are on the bridge. Some of you might have that, right? A head belief, but not a heart belief. <laughs> On a bridge, and you're like, yeah, I know it's going to hold me up, but then, okay, then uh, stand upon it. Be on it, and you're like, no, I ain't doing that. Why? Because your heart's not in it. You still have that doubt, that fear, I'm going to fall, I'm going to die. So the question is, did you put on the Lord Jesus Christ? When we talk about have you received Jesus Christ for your salvation, all of this ties together. So all of it ties together where, see, in the mind you know, but then your whole heart is put on it. Okay, now we go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. We're going to look at the source of faith. The source of faith. And the simple answer is in God. Now, the free grace people, I do not uh, believe in their soteriology. They do have some faults here and there. However, uh, we do primarily agree that it is simply faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is as simple and it's free. Uh, we are adamant against lordship salvation. So I like their chart here, which is why I'm going to use it. The chart really demonstrates, and it pictures very well, on how the source of our faith is truly on Christ. See that? So you see the pendulum, which I like right here. So the right balance, which is in the middle, you'll notice, is faith alone, Christ alone, and then that's why we have the, receive the grace and receive his salvation. That's genuine faith right there. But then, with this faith alone, it contradicts with lordship salvation. Lordship salvation boasts in sola fide. The Calvinists boast sola fide. And you might go, who cares? What does that mean? <laughs> yeah, I know. 
The Calvinists, they just like to use fancy terms and it makes them sound right. See? So as long as I say gobbledygook, then you're all going to believe me. So as long as I keep saying gobbledygook, then you're going to go, wow, that sounds biblical. Yes, I like to mock them. Why? Because you ought to know better than hearing good words and fair speeches that matches up with fanciful terms to find truth. You ought to know better than that. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. I mean, I'm questioning a lot of you who post comments and videos against me and even those who believe in me, whether you attack me or believe in me, if you're watching me online, are you looking in that book? Open that book. All right, don't just hear me talk and then you, you get offended because there's something I didn't say the right term or the way that I talked just sounded too coarse or you felt like there was a mean spirit in there. See, then you're judging by words, fair speeches, how fair the delivery is, how smooth it is. Look at that book. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Amen. Come on. Look at that book and then check it out if what I tell you is the truth or not. Now, notice the contradiction here because they use this fanciful term. It means faith alone. Well, how is that faith alone if they insist that there ought to be works coming out of your life? That's what lordship salvation teaches, that works. It's a faith that works, they say. Now, look at this. See? You didn't catch that, did you? Faith works. Did you look at that? Tricky, tricky. How is that faith alone? Faith works. Tricky, tricky. It just sounds nice. That's why you believed in it. A faith that works. Yeah, that sounds more logical than a faith that doesn't work. That just sounds logical. Hey, hey, did you actually examine it? Faith works. It's a, called a contradiction. <laughs> All right, the amazing thing, you know, let me use a little fanciful wordplay, all right, for some of these scholars. Because if you go from an epistemological method and look at epistemology and study the basics and the roots between certain terms and operations and methods, then you can come up with better criticisms and better outlooks. Y'all got lost on that? That's fine, all right? I threw that just in for the scholars, not for you. All right, anyway, Roman Catholicism. Over here, they see the honesty that, you know, you can't really call it faith alone. But we do believe in justi justification by faith. But if we're going to be totally honest, there's also works involved. So notice that the pendulum swings, see that? So from faith, it gradually goes to faith. A faith that, faith alone that works to faith and works. Yeah, yeah. And then there's another extreme right here where there's Christian pluralism and Christian universalism. In other words, faith alone, Christ alone is unnecessary because the person is already saved to begin with. That God already gave a universal salvation and there's no application on your part, uh, your part of believing. So a great example, and some people might get upset, but it's true, is John Hagee. He taught this blatant heresy where he thinks that Jews, because they are God's chosen people, they don't need to believe on Jesus Christ for salvation. So notice right here how so many wrong doctrines come out because they don't understand the basic. What's the source of faith here. It's all on God. But we saw earlier that there must be a belief on that if you want that source. Now, because it's all on God, we look at Romans 12, 3. The Bible says right here, For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, According as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Notice that Paul says that people shouldn't think highly of themselves because the source of their power and where they receive it from is actually from God who gives the faith to them. This is God the Father. 
And then we're going to see God the Son, which we're not going to turn to, but just write it down. Hebrews 12, 2. Hebrews 12, 2. The Son is the source as well. And then the Holy Ghost is also the source. 1 Corinthians 12, 9. 1 Corinthians 12, 9. Go to Romans 10, 17. Romans 10, 17. The second source. So we see God in his trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's the first. Second is the word of God. Go to Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. The Bible says that the Bible can give you the faith. So the reason why you're doubting and you don't want to be asked this, oh, pastor, I'm struggling, I'm doubting God, then I'm going to ask you, did you read your Bible? <laughs> it's supposed to give you faith. The Bible says right here, Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the what? Word of God. Okay, go to Luke 17, Luke chapter 17. The third one is prayer. Third one is prayer. Look at Luke chapter 17 and verse 5. And I like how this next picture demonstrates the hindrances, the hindrances to faith. From this nice little image, you'll notice right here that the hindrance, uh, faith is something that is the source from God, right? So then there's something that's blocking it at times. And the hindrances to the faith is right here. See, mountains that are not removed. The obstacle hindrances, these grow more and more and more that pushes away the source of your faith here. So what will help immensely is you have to observe the other source, and it's right here, prayer removes. Oh, let's... Uh, Prayer removes the obstacles. So I know it's kind of hard to see, so hopefully this one kind of helps. So prayer removes the obstacles right here. Okay. So have you been uh, praying? Have you been seeking the Lord's will? Have you been surrendering your doubts to the Lord? If you haven't, then that's the reason why you're still in doubt. And no matter how much God is the source for your faith, it's not going to mean anything to you. Don't act Calvinist and expect God to some, somehow give you a feeling where you're going to believe. you got to pray. Prayer is also the other source that can remove the hindrance and obstacle so that the power, which is from God, the source of faith, can be given to you. Luke chapter 17 and verse 5, the Bible says, And the apostle said unto the Lord, see that? Increase our faith. Boy, how many times have I done that, right? How many times? I like to ask you, how many times have you caught yourself doing that, right? 1 Corinthians 12, 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9. The last one is the gift of the Holy Ghost. The gift of the Holy Ghost. In other words, there is no doubt that some people, they tend to have more strong faith in the Lord than you do, right? And then we're like, what's the matter with me? There's something wrong with me. Well, you don't really have to beat yourself over the head because sometimes it could be perhaps that the person was just gifted by the Holy Ghost. He just has the skill or the gift or the talent more than you to more easily rely and trust in God. For all you know, you had a life full of trauma, betrayal, mistrust, and hurt by so many peoples and things and that's the reason why you weren't as blessed as other people who, had, uh, who, who were able to find it more easy to have faith in the Lord and faith in God's ways of doing things. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. So notice right here, God gives different gifts to people. So he won't give the same level of faith uh, to other people. Sometimes he gives more faith to other people. Romans 10, 17 again. Romans chapter 10. And then we'll look at verse 17 again. I also want to add this, is that just because you are less gifted in faith, 
does not mean that you're going to have less faith than other people who, ha who has more gift of faith than you do. You might say, why? The reason why is, don't forget the power and sources from God. So, maybe God can give you more faith compared to the other person who finds it easier to have faith. The reason why is because you need it more. So, pray for it more, right? And you might, you might have more faith than the other guy. Okay, let's look at Romans 10 to 17. We're going to look at the objects of faith here. When you have faith, it's pretty obvious that you're going to rely upon something. You can't just say, I believe, and there's nothing you rely on. Correct? There's got to be... There's got to be an object that you put your faith upon. See, that's the reason why, I, I mean, this is such a basic, but a lot of people don't think. They don't look at the basics and catch themselves. The reason why you struggle so much having faith as you're going through your trial and temptations is you put more faith on a wrong object. So, for example, the feelings of your flesh during trial and suffering, that's what you're putting your faith upon. No wonder you're having trouble believing in God, trusting in God through the storm. So you got to find the right object. So if you have the right object where your faith can be upon, hey, the trial can hit you hard, but as long as your faith is not on it, you'll still be stuck on that object as long as the object is right. Did that make any sense to you? All right, so there are two. God made it very simple for you. He didn't make it hard. He gave you two objects to put your faith upon that will help you immensely. And you got to put your faith on those things. You don't have to think of so many practical tips, methods, psychological helps, and all that but to help you out with your faith and your Christian walk. You only need two things. God made it simple for you because your flesh overcomplicates stuff a lot of times. And it's just so hard. And then you're sick and tired of hearing 100 different counsels and 100 different methods to overcome your complicated problem, and you think it's just so hard. No, it's not. God made it simple for you. You're just not putting your faith on it. On it. All right? So what are they? Well, from this chart right here, uh, the reason why I give this chart is our Christian walk is faith. And then you'll see the benefits that we receive. And then we'll look into that a little later. But faith is such an e essential ingredient, a widespread ingredient throughout our everyday lives, that as we live our faith in God, when we look back, a lot of times we have to look back through history behind us that will help us in our faith, and even forward, we can see in our future, as we apply the faith, how it'll operate. So here's Jesus Christ dying on the cross, and then things that were quoted from the Word of God uh, about his resurrection, and then his event, his life, that we look back on, which is why we live by faith, and then things that will happen in our future. And because of what the Word of God said, because of how uh, we're going to uh, expect and anticipate on what's going to happen ahead of us up in heaven, at the judgment seat of Christ, in the tribulation and the millennium. That's the reason why we still live by faith. So the point is, throughout our everyday life, including past, present, and future, how we're involved in history, Faith is such an essential ingredient. Without it, everything in our past, we discard it, and everything in our future, we discard it. Not, not just your present. So understanding how important, significant this faith is, that's why you need to find the right objects. So Romans 10, 17, the obvious one is the word of God. The Bible says, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. This is the only visible tangible object that you have in your hands right here. So with this, this is the object that you got to put your faith upon. 
Go to Romans 3.22. Romans 3.22. The second object is Jesus Christ. The second person or object, whatever, that you want to put your faith upon is Jesus Christ. Now, you might say, well, didn't you say that the source of faith already is Jesus Christ? What do you mean the object? So in this scenario, this case, Jesus Christ gives you faith. But in return, what you need to do with that face, with the face, faith is to put it on Jesus Christ. See, when you believe, you need some object to put it upon. The Bible, we get it, right? The Bible, we get it because when we're going through doubt and fear, we have to open the book, and then there's a verse right there, and then that verse is where we put our faith on it, and then we believe it for certain. So, it is not just a source, but an object, the Word of God. The same thing with Jesus Christ. But how this is explained is that, as a matter of fact, we all know Jesus Christ gives us a faith. That's the source. But when you have faith, it's important that you've got to have someone you believe in, someone's word that you got to believe in. So when we say the word of God, sure, but the word of who, right? God, Jesus Christ. You cannot trust unless there's someone involved. See, that's the bottom line. Everybody says that I have some level of faith or every faith is different, but they're all the same thing. And I believe in God. But when you critique it, when you examine that, their faith is in the wrong place and person. Because when they say believe in God and I have faith and all faiths are different, but they're the same thing, it could be on Islam, it could be on Muhammad, it could be on Joseph Smith, it could be on a wrong Jesus. See, so that's the reason why you need to have the right object right here. And we're talking about the right Jesus Christ in Romans 3, 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. So notice right here when we're talking about believers, I'm not talking about Buddhists, Muslims, and Christians, and Jews all together. That's wrong. What I'm talking about right here is that when I say believers, it's those, they are those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. Jesus, who is God, died, buried, and resurrected where the word of God dictates it. All right, now we go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And then we're going to compare some of the things on the chart as well on the results of faith. So that's the next section, the results of faith. So we've looked at uh, the uh, definition of faith. We looked at the source of faith, objects of faith, now results of faith. If you have faith, this is what's going to happen. A lot of benefits are going to come out of your life. And the question is, do you have these benefits? If you don't, then you should examine your faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. We know God exists. That's the first one. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that what? He is. Second benefit is Ephesians 2, 8. Ephesians 2, 8. We get saved. We get saved. I mean, saving your soul from hell, giving you a home in heaven, I'm... That is, that is very important. That's a benefit you get out of faith. Faith is so important in the Word of God. Faith is extremely important in the Word of God. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. The Bible says, For by grace are ye saved through faith. So notice right here, you get saved because of faith. John 1.12. John 1.12. The third benefit is we receive Christ. We receive Christ. So not only are you saved and you go to heaven, but God, he could have just, all right, I saved you, that's it. He didn't have to be with you. 
right? But when you get saved by faith, not only are you saved, you get Jesus Christ in you when he didn't have to. That's a huge benefit. John chapter 1, verse 12, But as many as received him, to, get, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that what? Believe on his name. So when you believe on his name, at the same time you're receiving Jesus Christ in you. All right, fourth one is Romans 5, 1. Fourth one is Romans chapter 5, verse 1. We are justified. We are justified. So don't, try, uh, don't conflate I'm justified with I'm saved. True, they have, this, uh, they have the same thing about salvation, but they're totally different in operations. God could have just, you have to understand this, God could have just saved you and that's it. But when you got saved, God applied so many different operations on you just for believing. So there's a huge benefit. Amen. There's a huge benefit. So justification is different from salvation, even though it is the same. So what's the difference? The difference is, is that, remember from our previous study from long ago, justified means that you are declared holy in front of God. Not just saved, but declared holy. The Bible says in Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 3, Galatians chapter 3. I mean, people talk about, well, I'm saved, but because of my sins, how do I know I'm really saved? Well, that's why you need to know that you're justified, see? That means you're declared holy. Why? Not because whether you sin or you live clean. You're declared holy based on what? Believing. If people knew that, then they wouldn't doubt their salvation, right? See, these basics are so important. Because you get so many wrong doctrines because these people don't go back to the basics. All right, Galatians 3.26, the fifth one is we become the children of God. We become the children of God. The Bible says, for ye are all the children of God by faith. What a blessing. God can call you my child. Acts 26.18. Acts 26.18. You get a father and son relationship. Do you know how big of a benefit that is? You have more favoritism, that means. You have more access. You have that intimate relation. Not just being saved. Don't just think faith has to do with salvation and that's it. You miss out a lot then. Notice Acts 26, 18. The sixth one is we are sanctified. We are sanctified. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Uh, why is sanctification so important? It's because sanctification is not just being declared righteous. It's being separated from sin and put onto holiness. So you're able to not just become holy, but do holy things. You might say, why, why is that important? Why? It's simple, stupid, because when you lived your life wickedly in sin, if you're a lost sinner, it doesn't matter how many good works you do, you'll still be sinful in God's eyes. So that's a very big deal. That's why I said stupid, because I want you to, not, not to be mean, but to try to make people think here that, hey, I hope you're paying attention. There's a distinguishing with sanctification from justification and justification from salvation. You have to know those distinctions. That way you can really appreciate your salvation. Uh, 1 Peter 1.5. 1 Peter 1.5. The seventh one is we are kept. We are kept. So when you believe on Christ, that means you're kept there. And you cannot lose your salvation. So people that talk about you can lose it, they didn't read about keeping it. <laughs> Go to 1 Peter 1.5. Notice who keeps it in 1 Peter 1.5. Not you, but God. Who are kept by the what? Power of God. Through what? Through how well you do. Through, uh, you know, unless you sin right here. No, through faith. If all you did was believe, then you're already kept by God's power. That's strong. Unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Powerful. Okay, 
Uh, go to Hebrews 4.3. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 3. The next benefit is we have rest. We have rest. See, it's not all about just salvation. It's also your everyday living. So do you have peace? And if not, why? You don't have faith. That would be a huge benefit if you have faith. You're going to have a lot more mental stability, don't you think? You'll have more peace in your heart. The Bible says, Hebrews 4, 3, for we which have believed do enter into what? Rest. How about that? The next one is John chapter 20. John chapter 20. And then alongside it, I want you to write Hebrews 11. The whole chapter. The whole chapter, Hebrews 11. And then your other hand to go to John chapter 20, verse 29. The ninth blessing is we gain blessings. We gain blessings. So if you believe, you know what the huge benefit is? God's going to reward you for it. He doesn't have to. Why should he bless you? Why should he reward you just for believing? I mean, if you believe, that's the blessing itself, is it not? You get rest, you're kept by the power of God, you're declared his child and all that. So believing is already a blessing in itself. But it, God's saying that if you would just keep believing, I'll reward you more and more for it. Huge benefit, right? John 20, 29, the Bible says, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And if you look at Hebrews 11, you're going to find out that people... Uh, and even Old Testament saints, they didn't see God's promise fulfilled in their lifetime, but they believed anyway, and God said, because of that, I'm going to reward you immensely. Yeah. All right, Matthew 17, verse 20. 17, 20. The last one is we have power. We have power. So not just... <laughs> this is amazing. <coughs> When you believe, not only do you have power to receive Jesus Christ, like we saw in John 1.12. When you believe and have faith, not only do you have the power to be kept in salvation, like we saw in 1 Peter 1.5, but just power itself in general. Do you realize how powerful faith is? It can remove mountains in your life, impossible scenarios always have been removed through the power of just faith itself, believing. Me pastoring in the Bay Area here is an example of what? This is a miracle, right? It requires a lot of power to do that. Yeah. And what did I do? You can talk about all my hardworking efforts, but I know from comparing statistics and other people who work harder than me, it will be a zero chance and failure. Yeah. The only way I succeeded was just simply believing yeah. the Lord. And then, the Lord, uh, and then the Lord turned it into power where I was able to glean these fruits. Another example is when you pray. Sometimes you pray for impossible things. An impossible scenario like your loved one getting saved, right? right. But you believe in God's power and you've seen how God can turn those things around. See, faith is power. Matthew 17, 20. And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Wow. Impossible things change just because of faith. Isn't that something? All right. Now I want you to turn to <clears throat> Hebrews 11 again. Hebrews 11. And then your second hand to go to 1 Peter 3. Hebrews 11, and then I want you to go to 1 Peter 3. When we talk about faith, it's one thing to believe in it, hear it, and know it, but those hindrances, right? Those hindrances. And they're very strong. 
and we need to target those hindrances. We need to know what they are so that we can get rid of those things and let faith have its work in our lives. So then, what are the hindrances? Can you tell me, Pastor? I'd be happy to, because I need to work on them too. First one is sight. Sight. All right, so in our everyday life, we're going to have uh, these following hindrances that are really going to bother us. So I'm going to talk, talk about things that will block our faith. We see here that from demonstrated earlier, the benefits of faith, right? Because of our way of living. But now let's look at the hindrances. And then the first problem is sight. That's the first problem. Why? Because when you see it, then you'll believe it. That's the typical atheist mentality. That's a typical scientist mentality. Empiricism, etc. It's hard for us to believe when we don't see something. So Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things what? Not seen. So then if we see, then it's going to hinder us. So we're going to look at 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter 3. But there is something that you have to understand here. There are things in life that you do not see, yet you still believe, don't you? For example, if, you're, if you buy uh, an oil container... You never saw what's inside the container, but you just took it by faith that it's going to be oil inside the container, not water. Why? Well, here's another thing. You go to the taxi driver and then, well, you know, this, I wrote these notes like almost 10 years ago, so things have changed with Uber now, right? But uh, back then, and there are still some things now, like in restaurants concerning tips maybe and stuff like that, so there have been taxi drivers or tips that you give to restaurants or even other business transactions where the worker believes that the rider or the customer will pay ahead even though they already give the service. So even though they don't see the payment, the employee is going to take by faith, hey, my customer will pay me eventually. So I just take it by faith. Why do people operate that way? You know that? So I, I don't care if you're the, heart, the most severe atheist. I don't believe in an atheist. I don't believe in agnostics. There's no such thing. Why? Because then you'd be paranoid freaks. Yeah. And I know you don't live that way. I know that you live by faith. People don't, uh, be, people don't do things without believing all the time. And they don't believe all the time uh, with seeing. There are times that they do it without seeing. Actually, let me add this more strongly. Even most of the time, you believe without seeing. You just have to think about that. You believe most of the time, uh, you believe most of the time without seeing. I mean, you're going to take it for granted and you're going to believe that, uh, when I, uh, that I'm going to be here Sunday, that I'm not going to be here. Do you require evidence for that? No, you just believe it. Now, see, why is it that we have this? Now, this is a very intellectual argument, even though this is a very basic one. So uh, I'm surprised how so many Christian debaters don't use these practical aspects. Because even the most hardcore atheist, Bart Ehrman, is a believer without seeing things. So it doesn't matter how strong of an agnostic or atheist you are. Everyone has to believe. Why? Because that's practical. That's just common sense. No one lives without uh, believing without seeing. Amen. Everybody lives that way. Most of the time, too. So why is it that we operate that way? You ever wondered why? If there's enough reason behind it, that's it. So you saw a pattern of me coming here every Sunday all the time. So you're going to take it for granted I'm going to be here the next Sunday. See? Uh, you take it for granted that the Business is going to lose its business if they give you a wrong product, even though you didn't see it and you took by faith and bought it. The even the employee is going to take it by faith that you're going to pay him or her. Why? Because society, that's the norm. That's a cultural norm that's practiced. See, the point is, is that as long as there's some lo something reasonable or logical, then 
it is still reasonable to believe without seeing. It, faith does have reason. If you look at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, the Bible says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a what? Reason of the what? Hope that is in you. Remember Hebrews 11.1? 1? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. They match. Amen. All right. Matthew 14. Matthew chapter 14. Theologians and professionals and debaters who go even against the most hardcore atheists or skeptics or agnostics, I mean, uh, they could well uh, learn from this basic doctrine. That would have helped them immensely. That's why we Christians know we don't know enough, all right? I know you know all the deep doctrines. You're so smart and you can use apologetics backward and forward. But to be quite honest, you need to go back to basics. That way you can hone your deep knowledge already better. Okay, all right, now we're going to look at uh, Matthew 14 and then verse 29. Second obstacle is fear. The second obstacle is fear. Why? Because even though you want to believe, you're just too scared. <laughs> and the reason why you're too scared is because you keep looking at what scares you. See, wrong object, remember that? What you got to look at, the right object. Are you looking at the Word? Are you looking at Jesus Christ? Notice that Peter didn't do that. Verse 29, and he said, Come, and when Peter was come down out of the ship, and he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. See that? He's, he's looking at the wrong object. He's looking at his fear. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand, and caught him, and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Yeah, you know now why you doubt it. Because you looked at the wrong object, your fear. All right, go to Job 9. Job 9. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. The third hindrance, and this is the most uh, unpopular one that everybody hates. Suffering. Suffering. All right, go to Job chapter 9. Job, that man, you have to give him a lot of credit, right? That man believed in God. That man was rewarded twice from God. So righteous, so holy, so much full of faith was he that he even uh, prayed for his family members that the Lord would show mercy on them, not just on himself. So he thought about others. But even a man like that could lose faith like that. Why? Suffering kicks in. So we go to Job chapter 9, and then we'll look at verse 16. The Bible says, If I had called and he had answered me, yet would I not believe that he had hearkened unto my voice. Wow, so even if God gave physical evidence, empirical evidence, where you can even hear it and see it. Why? Because of verse 17. For he breaketh me with the tempest, and multiplieth my wounds without cause. He will not suffer me to take my breath, but filleth me with bitterness. Oh, so you know what? If you knew this basic practical doctrine, then you would know why no matter how scientific your argument is against the atheists, they still won't believe. Why? Because it's not, the issue for them is not really that I need more evidence. No, we already gave, gave them enough evidence, logical arguments. You know what it comes down to with all of them? And even Bart Ehrman admitted this, what made him finally become atheist. Why do bad things happen? Yes, yeah. Suffering is the key. It's more of an emotional reason not logical. All right, uh, go to Matthew 16. Matthew 16. We'll look at verse 8. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 8. 
So you have to always constantly look at yourself and see, am I depending constantly on my feelings here? If you always do that, then feelings will override your faith. Are you believing more or are you feeling? That's how you're going to overcome suffering. Are you believing more or are you feeling? All right, Matthew chapter 16, verse 8. The fourth one is reason, reason. Notice right here, which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why is their faith little? Why reason ye among yourselves? Now, ain't that interesting? Because we mentioned before faith has reason, correct? But notice a contradiction right here that it seems like reason is a hindrance to faith. So what's the explanation behind that? The explanation is very simple. Go to Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55. The simple explanation is because God's reason is so high and lofty, your intellectual brain is too dumb to wrap, your, to wrap around it. It's that simple. I mean, if you put your uh, mind capacity and compete it with God's mind capacity, you think you'll survive? No, your mind's going to blow up. It's going to go out of circuit. It's going to go, ah, and then just destroy itself, obviously. So you have to understand that that's the reason why a lot of times when God does things that, were, that are too high and lofty for us, too smart, too intellectual for us, in our eyes, in our mind, we perceive it as it's too complicated or it doesn't make sense or unreasonable. That's why God's ways of doing things sound unreasonable to us. And if people think that that's not true, the easy evidence is science. Because there's a lot of scientific workings that in our own common sense minds doesn't seem to make sense. But when you get into and study science more, then you're like, oh, it does make sense now how those things work, right? Because obviously heavy objects don't fly. I mean, that's just common sense. Heavy objects will never fly. But why do we see heavy objects flying? In our, if I were you and you were me and we didn't know about science, we didn't know a thing about airplanes or the scientific workings on how airplanes adopt and use them, then in our minds we would think that that doesn't make sense. But until we study the scientific workings on how we can overcome gravity and how we can use uh, certain things of science, air, energy, and electricity, and then the mechanics to help it to fly, then it makes sense to us. That's the same thing with God's ways, is it not? With God's ways, look, it's too high and lofty like science that we don't understand it. So at first, when we use our common sense minds, we're like, that's unreasonable. That doesn't make sense. Heavy objects don't fly, God. Doesn't God's way of doing things seem that way? <laughs> that heavy objects don't fly. That's such a contradiction, God. That doesn't make sense. You claim it makes sense, but it doesn't make sense. But until you study his inner workings, like science, and delve into it, and that don't happen until time passes by. And you and I know that until your experience and knowledge matures more. And you and I know from such maturity and growing experience, when we look back, then we realized how immature our knowledge was and we should have had faith in God. Does that make any sense? Okay. Go to uh, Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9. Notice that the Bible explained to you why it doesn't make sense to us. Because God's ways is just too high and lofty. It's not our ways. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are what? Higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Simple. All right. John 8. John chapter 8. And we'll look at verse 45. John chapter 8. And then we'll look at verse... 45. The last hindrance to faith 
is truth, believe it or not. Truth. You might say, why is truth a hindrance to faith? Because you don't want the truth. Now, you know how many people think that they really want the truth? No, you, you don't want the truth. If the truth is, I'll tell you what the truth is. If the truth is really the Christian way of doing things, then you wouldn't want to do it because what is it asking of you? The truth is you're going to burn in hell for all eternity if you don't believe on Jesus Christ for your salvation. And that the Christian life is not popular and the whole world is against you for believing in that. The majority of religions are against you for believing in that. Your family and friends and loved ones might look down on you. And then how stupid do you look in the eyes of educated people to go by faith, not by sight and not by education and knowledge? See, truth hurts. Truth might cost you your relationships. Truth might cost you your identity. Truth might cause you to sacrifice a lot of things. And the truth hurts. So a lot of times truth is not easy. It's ugly. Truth requires a lot of changes in your life. You know that? That's why people walk away and get mad in preaching. Their excuse is, oh, it's just too mean. No, it's because it's something you don't like to hear. Because it is different from your own way, comfortable way, comfortable routine, usual way of doing things. It's against your norm, your own belief. See, so if there's a belief called truth and your belief, you know what you would prefer? Your belief. That's why, why do you think people are giving such ridiculous, nonsensical arguments that truth is relative and that all ways of religious ways are the same way to heaven? You know, you got to realize that is truly nonsensical. And no offense, it is really stupid. Now, you got hurt by, by hearing that, but let's just use common sense, okay? You know what the easiest evidence is? The easiest evidence that all religious ways or Christian doctrines or teachings are not the same thing is because you disagreed with what I just told you now. Use your little common sense here. See, so no, it's not all the same thing because you, the way that I talk is different from the way you perceive things now and you just got offended and mad. Look at all the religions and their doctrines and their beliefs. You'll find contradictions, contradictions. Here's the simplest one. You ready for this? The simplest one is that uh, Islam, Buddhism, and then Catholicism, and then other world religions, they teach that uh, faith is important, but you must have works. And then Christianity teaches you only have faith, no works. What does that mean? That's called a contradiction. How, you know, people, they want to pretend that's not a contradiction. That's a contradiction, all right? If I told you, wash the dishes, and I told you three seconds later after that, don't wash the dishes, then what are you going to do? You're going to go, oh, you meant the same way? All right, then what did I mean to say? See, that's the same thing with all these different doctrines and teachings. Then what did they mean to say? See, people are not using common sense. Uh, <laughs> John chapter 8 verse 45 John chapter 8 verse 45 and because I tell you the truth what you believe me not you think that because you get the truth it's easier for you to believe no it's harder truth can be such a big hindrance to you to believe so the thing is the easy question then which is a hard thing to do but it's an easy question do you really want the truth or not? It's that simple. No matter the cost, no matter what it will cost you, do you really want the truth? Uh, the, a very common saying, whether unbelievers or believers, pretty much everyone agrees with this one almost, is that um, a comfortable lie is always better than the hard truth. People prefer a comfortable lie more than the hard truth. People want to live in a fantasy that pleases them than reality that just uh, costs sacrifice and pain. I mean, uh, let me be a little worldly here. You know, that's why when you watch the first movie, The Matrix, some of those people, they could care less if they're stuck in that little bubble and then their mind is hooked to The Matrix. And that's, uh, they could care less about that. Why? Because as long as I'm in this fantasy that looks real to me, 
as long as I'm rich and I can live in this kind of world, I'm willing to live in the matrix. See that? If we're going to see the ugly truth, you know, the red pill or the blue pill, which one you want? Well, your life will never be the same, right, once you choose the truth. No wonder that the world hates your guts after that. It makes sense, right? All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that uh, today's teaching has been eye-opening and helpful to our hearers in understanding what your word truly teaches, what is faith, how we can live it, and even defend it from difficult arguments and questions and practical struggles we go through in life. I pray that this so-called basic concept has helped us even more so with our complex and hard scenarios we go through. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.